In this video, I cover the test sample construction for the FT8 noise immunity study. So here we have the display we're going to work with today. <clears throat> At the top is an application called Audacity. And I'm using that to record sounds uh, from uh, WSJT. And uh, those will be FT8 sounds. Here's the level of the volume playback that our audio uh, application is going to give us. That's the play button and the record button. And along here, we'll see the levels as we record, and we'll see <clears throat> also the levels as we play back. So we'll use the transmit function of WSJT, record that, and then play it back so we can uh, get consistent uh, readings uh, of the receive capability. This is the pan display of Audacity, and when we uh, select play later or actually record, we're going to see it record the tones as they're emitted uh, from uh, WSJT. Um, we have some controls. We can cut and edit the audio to suit our needs. Um, and so it gives us quite a bit of flexibility. In the bottom part of the display is the uh, WSJT um, display of the signals we're actually going to transmit, the messages we're going to transmit and receive. So I started this up. I started Audacity, and we'll adjust the scale here. And then I'll go turn on uh, the uh, transmit capability of WSJT, and we can watch the FT8 signal as they appear. This is an audio-to-audio -audio connection. So you can see we were transmitting in the right side is our transmit display at 1500 hertz and that's my CQ call. Uh, I'll tone down the FT8 signals uh, from here on out and all I'm doing is doing that being an edit capability that levels will actually stay the same. I'm going to record four separate tones and so that'll be four separate transmissions. Each transmission is 15 seconds long. The period between the transmissions is also 15 seconds. Uh, my purpose is to build a stable set of samples that we can use then to test various types of noise against and understand what the implications of those noises are. Um, I want four tones to give us a little bit of variety, or four separate samples, and then we'll loop those using the Audacity's loop play capability so that we can have a continuous uh, transmission source that is uh, stable and is uh, really calibrated in a way that we can repeat from test to test. So this is the fourth tone. Um, I'll get the beginning of the fifth tone, and then we'll edit the tones uh, using Audacity so that we've got a, a good sample set. You can see in the transmit display that uh, the decibels are missing. It just says transmit, and that's because we don't measure the decibel level to the transmit. Uh, also, the delay time is not listed in the transmit display, and I'll explain why that is. So now I'm going to edit our five samples. I'm going to get rid of the end sample by cutting it, and I'll use Control X from here out to cut. And I want to get rid of the random delay we had at the beginning. I had to wait until I could synchronize with the 15 second clock. So we'll get rid of that and just do a control X to cut that. And that'll uh, disappear here in a second. 
And now I'm going to take the 15 second at the end and I'm going to move that to the front by doing a cut and paste. So let me just expand the scale a little bit so I can see better what I'm doing. And then we'll cut that segment and we'll go back to the beginning of our samples and we'll insert the segment we just cut into the front. And that will give us our four samples beginning with a silent period of 15 seconds of silence followed by 15 seconds of tone 15 seconds of silence and so on we can play that back using the loop play capability so there are our four samples and we're ready to begin our receive exper experiment uh, but we have to play in the loop play mode and that has to be time to start with a 15 second interval. Uh, so I hit loop play about two seconds before the interval starts and that seems to work out about right. And we're going to see that shortly uh, when the time period rolls up. So it started, so we're now in loop play and we're going to see our samples sent back to us in the receive side, the left side of the WSJT display. I've pulled up the pan display and so we can see at the top of the screen uh, the spectrum and the waterfall and there's the orange indication that we're receiving the signal from Audacity. And keep in mind this is all in baseband. So there's signal to noise ratio. The delay tone, so it's about half second off when I started it. I receive frequency of 1500 hertz in my CQ message. This is all coming from the stored WAV file in Audacity. Uh, I turned the tones down because we don't need to hear the tones anymore. You know what's going on there. So there's our second sample. And I've got the cursor on the receive side of the WSJT display. Uh, the receive information is repeated on the transmit side on the right under the label receive frequency. Don't know why they labeled it that way, but that uh, happens whenever your own call sign is detected in the received message. So typically you'll see somebody answering a CQ and showing up over there. Our decibel level is steady at 7 dB. Uh, the delay is varying a little bit, but that's normal. So we've got a sample that's set for 7 dB with the sound settings that I've saved so I can repeat this uh, as many times as we need to, uh, to do different experiments with different noise sources. And we'll see it loop now. So we put this in loop. So we're going to come back to the beginning of the sample set. And uh, the delay will be somewhat different because I didn't precisely cut the 15 second intervals but they're close enough for what we're doing so we'll see what that delay is as soon as that next sample gets received and recorded by WSJT received and decoded so it's being received now and it's decoded and uh, there it is and so we see our delay tone went from 0.4 to 0.2 which means there's 200 milliseconds probably uh, short of our 15 seconds and or actually it's probably it's maybe long but in any event there's a 200 millisecond deviation so so we've got our uh, loop samples working and so now we can look at doing some uh, different experiments and seeing how different settings and different noise sources affect that 7 dB uh, level we have in our sample Again, I have to re make sure I record all the microphone and speaker levels so that I can always repeat and get back to this 7 dB. I showed 7 dB. It's a little hot. It's hotter you would normally see in uh, QSOs in normal transmission. But you do see levels above 7 dB. But that gives us a lot of downward room to measure the effects of various impairments that we're going to impose on our model. 
I'm going to spend a couple of minutes uh, describing some theory behind FT8 because it has some very practical implications around our measurements. Here are the essentials of FT8, the characteristics, and that's a lot to read, but I do want to point out some important elements here. Uh, the 15 seconds we've talked about before, and of course that um, is a really one of the basis and foundational ideas in FT8, the 15 seconds send and receive. The actual transmit time in that 15 seconds is 12.64 seconds, and that's because um, the synchronization is required in all the clocks used by all the operators are not precisely on time. So there's uh, some leeway uh, inside that time envelope of 15 seconds on when you can begin and when you can end your transmission. This is a really interesting statistic. There are only 75 information bits in the packet that is sent in FT8 during that 15 seconds. There are actually 174 total bits, which includes 12 bits of cyclical redundancy check and 87 bits for forward error correction. That is, the decoder can tolerate uh, quite a few bit errors and still recover a completely valid package because there's the CRC allows the error to be found and the forward error correction allows it to be corrected. So in some sense, it's inefficient. If you had a perfect channel, you're sending 174 bits only to be able to find 75 actual information bits. But in the real world of radio, of course, uh, the channels have impairments, which is the whole subject of this little tutorial. And so this is a very efficient way of doing it. The modulation is eight frequency shift keying, which means there are eight tones, and uh, that eight tones yields us three bits because two to the third is eight. Our information rate, that is the amount of information received per second, is less than six bits per second, and of course we've talked about the operational bandwidth before. The decoding threshold, if you read uh, papers written by Joe Taylor and uh, his contributors uh, to the design of FT8, is cited as minus 20 dB signal noise ratio, and we're going to talk about that a bit more in the uh, coming slides. Uh, newcomers will find it uh, really quite astonishing that WSJTX decodes all FT8 signals in the passband at one time, not just the one set to receive. And so let's take a look at that. Here's a pan display from SJTX, and we see the passband here and all of the decoding signals, the, the FT8 signals that are being decoded, and of course this is the spectral display. The um, passband can be set by the operator. They can tune their receiver and set the filters in their receiver, and this is a range you might find in a typical receiver. But signal noise ratio calculations are generally computed based on 2500 hertz. Now let's look at a little bit of theory. Um, so from Shannon Hartley, uh, we have the theoretical limit on how much information one can get from a channel where W is the bandwidth of the channel and S over N is the signal to noise ratio of the channel. That's a linear signal to noise, meaning the signal and the noise uh, here are in watts, not in decibels. So it's log to the base 2 of 1 plus Sn times the bandwidth that yields the maximum information. Now if we rearrange that equation to find the minimum signal to noise can be achieved 
um, for a particular information rate and a particular bandwidth, we get this equation. That is the signal to noise that you receive and the signal must be greater than this value. That is, SNR is computed from that by just taking the log of the base 10 of that figure. And so that yields a threshold. That means the signal must be above that SNR value. So with FT8, I put in the information rate. This is the net information rate, the bandwidth. And that gives me a signal noise ratio minimum of minus a half a dB. So we must have uh, signals above that threshold or we'll have no chance of decoding them uh, if we had no error correction or cyclical redundancy check. But in WSJTX and in most programs, the passband noise is used, not the the noise in the channel itself that we're receiving. So we must make an adjustment. To do that, we take the log to the base 10 of the actual signal and we subtract from that log to the base 10 of the passband, which is where we're measuring the noise. So the signal is here, the noise is measured across the 2500 hertz, and that is a 17 dB differential. In addition, the forward error correction and cyclical redundancy check uh, yield a coding gain of about 2.5 dB. That is, we can lower our threshold 2.5 dB because we're going to get compensated by the forward error correction. That gives us our FT8 signal noise ratio threshold of a minimum of minus 20 dB, which means we can decode signals above that. What is the implication of that? Well, uh, the threshold using the passband, which is what we're going to see uh, on our WSJTX display, is minus 20B. If the signal we receive is above that, then we have a chance of decoding it. But the actual signal to noise ratio of if we were able to see the signal uh, noise would be minus 3DB. So we're using the passband instead of the actual signal noise uh, in our indices or our metric that we're going to be watching. Why do we do that? Why does WSJTX not use the actual signal to noise of the channel we're looking at rather than the passband? Well, you can't see the actual signal noise ratio of the observed channel or the one you're receiving because it's masked by the signal itself and you can't in processing disting distinguish the signal from the noise. Uh, for passbands populated with primarily FT8 signals, this is an excellent prox proxy and the only practical way of really doing it. So uh, the minus 20 B dB is the threshold we'll be looking for, but keep in mind it's not reliable. If the actual passband noise is different from the noise of the received signal, then the minus 20 dB threshold will not serve us well. We'll find times when we're able to decode below minus 20 dB and times when we find it impossible to decode even several dB above.